Draw me. I feel the Lord drawing us in this place. Hallelujah. I thank God for what he's doing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, it's good to see you here today. If this is your first time with us in Gospel Ministries, we we welcome you, and we're just so blessed and honored that you've come here to be our guest, and we want you to feel that way. We want you to feel welcome. We're so glad you're with us. Amen. I want you to make yourselves at home. If you have any questions about the church, please feel free to ask myself. I'm Pastor Kelly Starnes, uh, or you can talk with one of these ushers here in the back, and they can uh, give you some direction, but uh, we're just glad you are here. And uh, we want you to be welcome here in the house of God. It is good always to be in the presence of God. Amen. It is good always. You know, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Praise God. You know, I've just felt that way this whole week. Just excited to get here uh, in these prayer meetings. I'll tell you, just uh, the sweet spirit of God that we have felt all week long in this place and the people coming together. It's been wonderful. We've had some great prayer meetings this week and uh, some great personal breakthroughs this week. God is moving. Hallelujah. But I don't know about you, but I feel sharper in my prayer life. Amen. I feel like uh, more in tune with the Lord, and I trust you are as well. But I want to be in tune with whatever God is doing. I really appreciate uh, what Pastor Mike Pilcher said one time. We were in a prayer meeting and just praying, and I heard him say, Lord, I just want to be a part of whatever you're doing. Just make me a part of whatever you're doing. If we'll seek the Lord, not just seek results, but if we'll seek the Lord, he'll make us a part of what he's doing. I'm going to tell you there's nothing greater than that. Hallelujah. Praise God. i got a few announcements to make, and uh, then we'll get into the Word of God here. But uh, first of all, on Friday, uh, we are the young people are having uh, something they call Where's Maldo? Uh, you might be familiar. Years ago, we had those pictures that used to come out called Where's Waldo? And you had to find Waldo in the picture. Well, we do it at the mall. And so basically what that means is we have several people out at the mall uh, shopping or just hanging out out there uh, that are with the church. And the kids got to go through and find different ones and get signatures. And so it's a blast. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we need some Maldos. We need some folks that are willing to go out and just spend some time at the mall. It's not that long. Uh, Jason, what time is that going to be? Is that 6.30? 6.30 at the mall. And uh, so the Maldos need to be at the mall at 6.30. Okay. And so uh, if you can help us with that, all you got to do is go shopping. Amen. Amen. I got an amen out of the women, some of them. Hey, man, some still sleeping because of the hour change. The men looked at me like, you got to be kidding me. Well, there is a Cabela's, amen. Praise God. And so there is the redeeming factor of a Cabela's. Whoever thought to put Cabela's in the mall was a genius. The, the, the men will spend as much time in there as the women will spend in all the other 32 stores or however many there are, you know. And so, uh, amen. So if you want to come and help us and be a part of that, it's a good time of fellowship just to get together anyway. And uh, you, you can hide out in the backside of Target if you want to. But trust me, those kids will seek you out. Amen. And so uh, it's a fun time. If you want to come and help with that, please see our youth council uh, about that. Uh, Sister Cody, uh, Sister Lindsay, any of those can help you and get you signed up for that. But uh, they do need some folks. We got two so far, so we need some more and uh, just willing to go shopping. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then also, uh, next Sunday is going to be a little bit different around here. We're going to take next Sunday, take an opportunity. First of all, in the morning service, we're going to be just putting before you uh, the vision for our bus ministry and our children's ministry, sidewalk Sunday school and everything total. I, I'll tell you what, I feel God rejuvenating that and uh, doing some great works in, in our midst and through our bus ministry uh, and bringing people on board and becoming a part of that. But uh, Pastor Mark's going to be preaching next Sunday morning. I'm not sure uh, the condition or the shape I'll be in, but I'm sure hoping to be here for that. Amen. And uh, anyway, having said all of that, uh, that's what we're going to be doing next week on Sunday morning. And then Sunday afternoon at four o'clock, instead of having service in the evening time, we're going to have a big potluck fellowship, just a church gathering. 
and uh, just get together and eat and fellowship. And be four o'clock in the afternoon, it's going to be back here in the fellowship hall. We want you to come and be a part of it. If this is, if, if you're new to the gospel ministries, this is a great opportunity for you to come and meet folks and a great opportunity for us to meet you. Amen. And so if you want to get in, get plugged in, this is a great thing to be a part of. So plan on being with us next Sunday about four o'clock. And uh, we, we'll be getting together. If you can bring some food, uh, that'd be great. Uh, if you if you can't cook, or uh, that's okay. Just come. As all of us can eat, we do it well around here. Amen. We got some fantastic cooks here. And uh, so you'll enjoy that. But uh, anyway, uh, don't forget that. And then also, uh, one other thing I need to announce to you, a very sad situation. But many uh, might remember uh, Brother Vern Johnson uh, a few years back was an usher here. Uh, anyway, he passed away this week and uh, went on to be with the Lord. But uh, his funeral service will be this Friday, and it's going to be at the graveside there in Orchard Mesa Cemetery, and that's going to be at 11 o'clock in the morning on Friday. And so I've had several of you ask me about that, when that was going to be, and uh, if uh, you're not able to make the funeral but you want to just uh, you know give your condolences to the family, uh, feel free that there is a, a viewing the night before about six o'clock at uh, Brown's funeral home. And so praise God. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do. I know Vern went on to be with the Lord. We're going to get there soon. Amen. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Praise God. Hallelujah. We'll go in your Bibles this morning to Proverbs chapter four. Proverbs chapter four and verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. There's a verse here that very short and yet holds such a tremendous key to our spiritual lives. Something that is found here reveals so much. And I think if the Lord will help us here this morning, it reveals a lot of what we go through, why we go through it, why we deal with what we deal with why we have situations in our life like we do many times, but it also shows us the path to knowing God and to seeking His face. Amen. So in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, it just simply says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Would you bow your heads and let's ask God for the anointing of the Holy Ghost in this place. Lord, we come into this house this morning. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. We thank you for your great grace and your great mercy, O oh God. Jesus, we thank you for every person that you've brought into this house for this very purpose and for this very reason. You've got something to say to us, oh God. You've got something to do in our lives. God, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to fill this place, oh God. I ask you for your anointing to preach this message. I ask for the anointing to break every yoke in this house in the name of Jesus. I ask you, Lord, for the boldness, O oh God, the love, the compassion, everything that flows from the throne of God to fill this place this morning. And most of all, God, that you would talk to us out of your word, that you would reveal to us, O oh God, as only the Holy Ghost can do. Lord, I can give words, but you, Lord, can take those words to the depth of the heart, O oh God. God, I pray you would help us here today. To see it like you see it, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I, I had come across this passage of Scripture in my personal devotion some weeks ago, and I really felt God was dealing with me to begin to look deeper into what that was saying. Something caught me there. How many has ever been reading the Word of God, and all of a sudden a verse just jumps out at you, and God says, wait a minute, I've got something to say there. And for the course of several days after that, God just began to open my eyes to things. And I thank God for what God does through His Word. Hallelujah. I love His Word. His Word comes alive. Hallelujah. 
He's got something to say. No matter what, God's got something to say. Hallelujah. And that's the way it was with this verse. But as, as God began to lay these things on my heart, he never really quite turned me loose to preach on it. And I just kept laying these things aside, looking at them, praying about them. But this week in prayer meeting, I was praying. I said, oh, God, I said, whatever you're doing in gospel ministries, the last thing I want to do is step in front of that or hinder that. The last thing I want to do is just make a little aside to that. But I want to be a part of what you're doing. God, I want to know after a week of fasting and prayer what you've got to say to your people. Lord, we've laid the sacrifice on the altar. We've laid things before you, Lord God. But after this week is over with and after this week is done, God, what's your plan and what's your purpose? Was it just a fast to fast or was there something you sought after? I believe with all of my heart we've taken a step this week, but God's got somewhere to take us. Hallelujah. I believe God's getting ready to do something. And sometimes, many times, before God begins to move in our life, He wants to bring us to a place we can hear Him. He wants to bring us to a place we'll respond to Him. That the Word of God comes alive in our life. That our prayer life is more conducive. Our prayer life reaches into the heavenly so much faster and so much more powerful because the things that hindered are removed. Hallelujah. I'm excited about what God's getting ready to do, aren't you? Praise God. But as I was praying, I said, Lord, what do you want me to share with this church? And he brought this verse to my heart Friday night. He said, now's the time. I believe with all of my heart that what God has given in these few words are the answer to so many things, if we could but look at what Solomon meant when he said, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Hallelujah. As we look into this this morning, there's some things I want to show you, things I want to reveal. But you know, when you think about what God is doing in our midst and doing across the country, uh, I just keep getting reports of what God is doing in churches around America. Hallelujah. A church in Texas had backsliders come home just all in one week, one right after the other. Hallelujah. I told you about the church up north. They had service. Everybody in the house got full of the Holy Ghost at the same time. Praise the Lord. We're seeing a move of God across this country but you know, as we begin to think about that, if we're not careful, as we begin to pray about what God's doing and pray about the move of God in our own life, what, what we always tend to do as human beings, we always tend to begin to kind of formulate for God what we would like to see God do. Amen. We go back on former revivals and former moves of God and we think about things that happened and people got healed and people got delivered and people got set start kind of building prerequisite for how God needs to move in our life. And so we begin to pray for the results of revival, or we begin to pray for the fruits of a move of God. We, we say, God, we want you to save souls, and God, we want you to heal, and God, we want to see the gifts manifest in the church, and Lord God, we want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, and, and, and on and on, and God, we want you to fill us with the Holy Ghost. But I think what you'll find is anywhere God ever moved, God's people were not praying for results. They were seeking for the one that gives the results. In fact, you'll never find in Scripture where God tells us to pray for revival. Come on now. You'll see in Scripture where God tells us, seek my face. Oh, the wonderful verse in 2 Chronicles 7.14 said, If my people who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. He said, if my people will seek me, amen. He didn't say there, if my people will seek for revival. We all want revival, amen. We all want a stirring of God. We all want a move of God, but 
The recipe, the formula, if you will, if you want to call it that, is not to begin to ask God for certain results of a move of God. The answer is to seek God himself. Hallelujah. Not the fruits of the tree, but the fruit giver himself. Hallelujah. To begin to seek him. Glory to God. That being said, there is but one way to truly seek the Lord. And it's out of this that this message comes this morning. Here in this short verse given to us is a very necessary admonishment. And what is said here is the secret to a life in Christ. That if we can but take hold of what is said here and apply it, we would find the source of most of our problems, most of our worries, most of our fears, most of our defeats. But more than that, if we would hold on to what is being said here today, we would find great strength and victory and peace as well. The author simply says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence. When you look into that first part of that, it just simply says keep your heart, but keep it with all diligence. Amen. And if you look into that, what that really means, that term diligence means above all keeping. In other words, in all of your keeping, keep this above everything else. In all that needs keeping in your spiritual life, keep your heart above everything else. In everything that you need to pay attention to in your spiritual life, keep your heart above everything else. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, there are places on my property that uh, I keep better than other places. Amen. Some of us here, we might keep our front yards better than we keep our backyards. I don't know. Maybe maybe some of us, uh, the front of our house looks a whole lot better than the back of the garage. Amen. I've got a big, beautiful, white, uh, vital fence that I fenced off a section on the side of my garage because it's a pile of junk back there. Amen. But when you drive in my driveway, it looks good because you see a beautiful fence out front. That, that, That behind that fence is not kept as well. I've kept lumber over the years of projects and things I've built over the years, and I've just kept that lumber there and supplies and things like that. But but it's all fenced in, and I keep the front of it looking better than I keep the back of it. Amen. You know, when you think about your spiritual life, there's a lot of keeping to do. Amen. There's a lot of things we need to take care of. I've watched some of y'all with your lawns. You're incredible with them. You you go out there and you you take care of things. I mean, you keep things. A little old shoot of a weed comes up and you spot it like a radar from a hundred yards away, and and you're on it with some Roundup, you know, and, and because because you keep it, you stay on top of it. That's what that word means: is to keep it up, if you will, or or to keep it, to pay attention, to maintain it, if you will. There's things in our spiritual life that have to be kept. You've got to keep yourself before God. Amen. You've got to keep, come on now, these eyes from seeing things they shouldn't see. You've got to keep this mind from thinking thoughts they shouldn't be thinking. The Bible compare, or tells us and commands us to think on these things and then gives us a list of those things. A lot of our problems would go away if we just weigh the things we've been thinking about against that list in Philippians. And if it's none of those things, then quit thinking about it. You ever heard somebody say, I just can't stop thinking about it? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If you're born again here this morning, God gave you control of that. Hallelujah. You got to keep things right. You got to keep yourself in a place of prayer. You got to keep yourself in church. It's not enough just to get saved. It's not enough just to, uh, j- just to become part of the body of Christ, but you got to keep yourself there. But Solomon says, in all of you keeping, in everything that needs keeping, there's one thing above all others. Keep your heart above everything else. Oh, don't misunderstand me now. That's not telling you and me that it negates the keeping of all of those other things. It does not. We have to keep all of those other things. But above everything, as much as we put into keeping all of those other things, he says, keep the heart, and there's a reason. 
There's a reason. It may sound extreme this morning for Solomon to say that, but the reality of it is there's a reason for this. He said, keep your heart above everything else. Keep your heart. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. Keep this heart no matter what. Because out of the heart comes everything. The word issue in Scripture, when you're, when you're reading that in Scripture, you read it many times in Scripture, but what it means is what is brought forth out of your life. You might read in Ezekiel chapter 47 about the temple that the Bible talks about where a river came out from under the altar and out from under the door. And the Bible makes these specific words about that river that the waters issued out of the sanctuary. That means they came forth. That was the whole point of the vision is this river that healed everything it touched. It came from the altar and it came from the house of God. And we know that to be the reality. If we want such a river of the Holy Ghost flowing in our hearts and in our lives and in our services, it has to begin at the altar. It has to begin at the house of God. Hallelujah. You see, it issues forth. Glory to God. But then you go to the book of Revelation of a 200 million man army and they're riding horses and not ordinary horses. The Bible said issued forth from their nostrils smoke and fire and brimstone. It's what comes out of you. It's what's issued forth, if you will. And so Solomon begins to reveal to us what this means. He said, above all keeping, with all diligence, keep your heart because out of the heart comes all of the issues of life. Everything that comes forth out of your life comes forth from your heart. Everything your life produces comes out of your heart. Everything your mouth speaks comes out of your heart. Everything your mind thinks comes out of your heart. Let the magnitude of that sink in this morning. How you raise your kids comes out of your heart. What kind of a marriage you enjoy with your spouse comes out of your heart. Are you hearing me? Everything you do, how you work your job comes out of your heart. You ever heard somebody say their heart's just not in it? How we do what we do comes out of our heart. How we perform comes out of our heart. How we think comes out of our heart. Who we are comes out of our heart. When you begin to look at this through Scripture, you begin to realize everything comes from the fountain of the heart. Solomon says, above all your keeping, keep your heart, because out of it comes the issues of life. Let me read you a quote by Charles Spurgeon. He said, you have seen the great reservoirs provided by our water companies in which the water which is to supply hundreds of streets and thousands of houses is kept. Now the heart is just such a reservoir of man, and our life is allowed to flow in its proper season. That life may flow through different pipes, the mouth, the hand, the eye, but still all the issues of hand, of eye, of lip, derive their source from the great fountain and central reservoir of the heart. And hence, there is no difficulty in showing the great necessity that exists for keeping this reservoir, the heart, in a proper state and condition, since otherwise that which flows through the pipes must be tainted and corrupt. That ought to make sense to us here in Grand Junction. I don't know if any of you like to go up on the Mesa, but I sure do. I like going up there because there's over 300 reservoirs up there, 300 lakes. If you don't like what you're catching in one lake, go to another lake. If the fish ain't biting in one, go to another one right down the road. But I assure you somewhere you're going to catch some fish, amen. But as the lakes aren't just up there for fun, they're reservoirs. So many of them are. Those re it's a reservoir system that is up there. Many of those reservoirs feed the supplies for Ute water, some for Grand Junction, the city of Grand Junction. There's even reservoirs up there for the city of Palisade. But the point is they hold water for the drinking uh, population, those that are drinking water, those that are using water. Think, think about what that means for just a minute. That all that water held in all those reservoirs up there in that system, somewhere they come off of that mountain. Somewhere they come down through a series of pipes and they go down to Ute Water's treatment plant. 
and they get treated there, and then out of there, they begin to disperse throughout the valley. Have you ever thought about how many pipes that water goes through, and how many homes that water goes to, and in each home, how many spigots that water comes out of? Man, you've got outdoor spigots that water the lawn and the garden. You've got you've got showers. You've got bathroom sinks. You've got kitchen sinks. You've got dishwashers. You've got uh, you've got refrigerators that use that water. I mean, think about that for just a minute. It all starts way up there in that reservoir. It comes down off of that mountain and it splits into hundreds of thousands of different directions. But the condition of what comes out of every one of those spigots has to do with what up on that mountain. I'll give you an example of that. This summer, my wife and I had an interesting experience. We went out to lunch or dinner rather, and we sat down to dinner and you know how it is. You go out to dinner and usually the first thing the waitress does is come by, brings you a menu and a glass of water. That's pretty normal. She comes up and she brings us a menu, but no water. And she, she said, I'll be back to take your order as soon as you're ready. And and, and my wife looked up and says, may I have a glass of water, please? She said, absolutely, you can. She said, I just can't give it to you unless you ask. I said, really? <clears throat> she said, yes. I said, what changed? She, it was back in the summer. You remember when things got so dry in the drought? She said, you water had gone around to all of the restaurants in Grand Junction and asked them to stop serving water freely to their customers only if their customers asked for it. I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, they came and they asked you to stop serving just, just a glass of water. I said, man, that won't even make a dent in all of the water that's being used. I thought, I thought, what a small provision. She said, evidently, they're doing all kinds of things to try to cut back on the usage of water because we're running out. It was a couple of weeks later that I had the privilege of going up on the Mesa and driving around a little bit, and I was shocked at what I saw. This summer, I'm telling you, man, those lakes that I had fished in, had known since I was a boy, many of them were reduced down to a little puddle in the middle of the bed of that lake. Some of them I, I, that I've, I, I've had a little boat in had absolutely not one drop of water in. It was the saddest sight I think I'd ever seen up on that mountain, so dry. And I began to think about that as I prepared this message. Two weeks before that, the condition of those reservoirs affected even my wife and I sitting down to drink a glass of water in a restaurant. I want you to think about the magnitude of what Solomon is saying. Come on now. He said, above all your keeping, keep the reservoir of your heart. Maintain the reservoir of your heart. Keep it full of God. Maintain what's in it, what's allowed to reside there. Maintain where it's allowed to go and what it's allowed to do because out of that reservoir, everything of your life is affected. The world's got a lot of doctrine about the heart and about listening to the heart and we ought to listen to the heart and doing this. And it's funny because as so much under the banner of listening to the heart results in sin. Come on now. You see, the problem is that when mankind sinned, when Adam sinned, this great thing called the heart was tremendously affected. And if you understand, the Bible would later tell us that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? We need an answer for the heart. Come on now. And that answer, praise God, is Jesus Christ. But I want us to explore just a little bit deeper what the Word of God tells us really does issue out of the heart. Guess what? Did you know 833 times the Word of God addresses the heart? And it's got a lot to tell us about what goes on in the heart. In fact, if you look through Scripture, you find some astounding things are told to us about what comes from the heart, what happens in the heart, what is affected by the reservoir of the heart. First of all, the heart is the center of the intellect. Oh, my. According to Scripture, people do the following. They consider things in their heart. They meditate in their heart. They commune with God or even themselves in their heart. They hide God's Word in their heart. They imagine things in their heart. 
They keep things in their heart. They reason in their heart. They doubt in their heart. We ponder in our heart. We believe in our heart. Or we don't believe in our heart. We even sing in our heart. These things, these issues primarily involving the mind let you know that the fountain of the intellect is the heart. Come on now. The very fountain of how we think is the heart. The very fountain of what we choose to dwell on is the heart. The very fountain that directs our intellect is the heart. Come on, somebody. There's issues involving the mind, but these issues come from the heart. Then the Bible tells us that the heart is even the center of the emotions. My, my, the Scripture teaches us about a glad heart, about a loving heart, about a fearful heart, but about a courageous heart. Scripture teaches about a repentant heart. It also teaches about an angry heart. Talks about a revived heart, a pained heart, a grieving heart, a heavy heart, a humble heart, the excited heart, and even the troubled heart. These actions, these things spoken about in Scripture are primarily the emotions, but these emotions come from the heart. And so the heart is the fountain or the reservoir of even our emotions. Scripture goes on to tell us that the heart is the center of the will. This is huge. We read in the Bible that the, about a hardened heart that refuses to do what God commands. We read about a heart that is inclined to cling to God and to obey His testimonies. We read about the heart that intends to do something. We read about the heart that is set to seek the Lord, but also the heart that is set upon iniquity. We read about hearts that decide. We read about hearts that want to receive from the Lord. We read about hearts that desire to do something or engage in something. See, all of these activities are a decision. They're a choice. They're a choice of the will. But the will itself even issues from the heart. Are you hearing me this morning? Look at everything in your life that's coming from the heart. Look at everything that you think about that is coming from your heart. Look at the words that you have spoken that came from your heart. Come on now. Look at the emotions that you have gone through that are coming from your heart. It's been amazing. I'm fixing to have this surgery tomorrow, and I'm not looking forward to it. And I told my wife, she said, how are you doing with it? I said, I'm doing all right. She said, how do you feel about it? I said, it's interesting. You have these emotions about it. I feel like I'm getting prepared for death. Amen. So I got all this list of things to do, and they're going to go in and cut on me. I said, it's no big deal. It's just a shoulder surgery. I said, but there's emotions that goes with it. Guess what? Emotions come from the heart. Think about everything that comes from the heart according to Scripture. Everything of our life issues from that heart. Everything we do Everything we say, everything we are issues from the heart. No wonder Solomon said, above all of your keeping, keep this. I dare say we spend way too much time dealing with the problems caused by the heart instead of just dealing with the heart itself. Come on now. When man sinned, the heart got in trouble. The Bible said the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That is a fact. You can convince yourself of anything in your heart. There are people right now today that have convinced themselves it is the will of God to murder. That is not the will of God. But there are people across this country and across this world that have made it the will of God to commit murder, hatred, and so on and so forth. Our hearts can be easily deceived. We need a remedy for the heart. And His name is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus taught some things about the heart as well. We read that he called a multitude unto him in Matthew chapter 15 and 10. He said, hear and understand. It's not that which goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth. This defileth the man. 
And then later he said, these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witness, and blasphemy. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defileth not the man. You see, the Jews of that day were hung up on ceremonial washings and how you wash, and they didn't just wash their hands like you do. They, they washed all the way up almost to the shoulders. And it was a ceremonial thing and cleansing thing. And, and, and not to do that was to defile a person. But Jesus makes a point of saying, it's not soap and water that's the issue. It's not a little dirt on the hand that defiles a person. He said, it's what comes out of that heart that defiles a person. What has ever defiled you or what has ever defiled me, what has ever caused us to stand before God in a defiled manner, it came from our hearts. Come on now. We've got an interesting approach to sin in this hour where we kind of think, well, sin is, is just, you know, the things we're guilty of. It, it, we can usually blame that on something or somebody or uh, the guilt of a, uh, of a relative. or something. No, no, let me tell you something. Wherever we were defiled before God, it came from our own hearts. Man, that's what repentance is about. When you want to get right with God, the first thing you got to do is you got to take accountability. You got to say, Lord, mama didn't do this and daddy didn't do this and my ex husband didn't do this. My ex wife didn't do, no, no, I did this. And I lay this before you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin and cleanse my heart, oh God. Jesus went on to say, chapter 12, he said, either make the tree good or his fruit good, and his fruit good. Or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. He said, O generation of vipers, how can you be an evil? Speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. Evil man out of the treasure, an evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. That is a powerful verse. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That is an awesome thought, that our words will be taken into account at judgment day. Our idle words will be taken into account at judgment day. But Jesus gives the secret of it. He said the words that we speak issue forth, guess where? The heart. It's the heart. It's the heart. Solomon said it's the heart. If you'll keep the heart, it keeps the issues. Amen. Have you ever heard somebody say they got issues? We all got issues. Come on now. We've all got issues. But if we'll deal with the heart, we'll deal with the issues. Praise God. Oh, now, come on. Now, the Bible says he tells us, Jesus told us that where our treasure is, our heart will be also. That tells us that where our treasure is reveals where our heart is. Come on now. The fact that Jesus' ministry was directly related to the heart. That was the thrust of his ministry when he came. You see, the law came to deal with the sins that the heart committed. Come on now. But Jesus came to deal with the heart that committed the sins. Amen. You'll find that Jesus would compare to the law. He would say, the law say you're not supposed to murder. He said, but I would say if you hate your brother without a cause, he said, you've already committed murder in your heart. He said, the law says you're not supposed to commit adultery. It's against the law to commit that sin. Jesus said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed the sin in your heart. You see what he's doing? He's dealing with the fountain. That was his whole message. That was his whole thrust. It was to go to the fountain, to go to the source, to deal with what's already there. Friend, I'm going to tell you, I've known a lot of people, and I've spun my wheels just dealing with things that have come out of the heart. You have too. But Solomon's trying to tell us if we'll just deal with the source of it. If we'll just get down to the source of it. Hallelujah. He said, above all, keep keep your heart. Oh, my. Jesus came to deal with the heart. That was the thrust of his message, and friend, that is the thrust of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He came to change the heart of man. 
He came to give us a solution to the problem of that reservoir of life. Let me tell you something. When sin got involved and wrecked the human race, it wrecked the human heart. And all of these issues that we're talking about, if sin reigns in that heart, it will wreck the human life. The issues that come out of that heart are always going to be the result of what's in that heart. And a heart that is bound in sin, a heart that is shaped in iniquity, will always issue forth out of what's inside that reservoir. So Jesus came to give us an answer. He came to set men free. First of all, I thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ because he said if we'll confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He can take all of the things that your heart has been responsible for and he can forgive you, hallelujah, and he can cleanse you of it and he can set you free, glory to God. He can take the guilt and the stain. He can totally remove it, glory to God. If we'll believe Him for it, if we'll ask Him for it, the blood is applied to our life and literally the stain of sin is removed. Praise God. Oh, praise God that we can be forgiven. But what about the heart that did it in the first place? I've oftentimes used the example in peach trees out in front of my house. You can pick peach trees or peaches all you want to, but peaches coming back next year. You, you can deal with the sins of your life and get them under the blood all you want to, and thank God we can. Thank God we can stand clean before God. But what about the tree that bore those fruits in the first place? What about that heart? Well, I've got good news for you. There is a thing in salvation called regeneration. Hallelujah. It's recreation, if you will. It's something that God does. It's wonderful. It's glorious. He doesn't just come to forgive us of our sin or make us religious. God's not interested in making you religious. He's interested in making you new. Amen. He's not as interested in making you a church going, folks. He's interested in making you new folks. Hallelujah. And making you me a new creature, praise God. And if any man be in Christ, he said, we are a new creature and old things are passed away. Behold, all, new, all things become new. What is he saying? He said, I'm going to give you a new heart. Hallelujah. Praise God for the new creature. It has a new heart. This has been prophesied by the prophets even before Jesus ever came. Ezekiel said in 1119, I'll give them one heart. And I'll put them within them a new spirit. I'll, I will put a new spirit within you. I'll take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh. He said again in Ezekiel 36, 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your idols, and I will cleanse you. And then he says this, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit, and I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Hallelujah. Can I say to you this this morning that God's answer to the condition of the heart is to be born again, is regeneration. Hallelujah. When a person comes and repents of all of their sin and turns to God truly in their heart, and and they place their faith in Jesus Christ, regeneration begins to take place. And friend, it goes right to the source of the problem. Regeneration happens in the heart. Hallelujah. The person who repents from his heart of all of his sin and confesses in his heart that Jesus is Lord is born again and receives a new heart from God. Hallelujah. Can you imagine that old poison reservoir that's been spitting out the poison, that's been wrecking your life. All of a sudden God comes and scoops it out and cleanses it and puts in fresh water, hallelujah, and a fresh source, glory to God. And out of your life comes issues now that are totally different. I talk different, hallelujah. I act different, hallelujah. I entertain myself differently, glory to God. I don't tell jokes like I used to tell jokes. No, no. And I don't hang with the friends that come on. Are you hearing me, church? Because the heart's changed. Let me say this to you. If we haven't had a heart change, we hadn't got saved yet. We've learned to play church in this hour. We've learned how to teach people to act saved without a changed heart. I'm going to tell you Solomon had it right. If that heart is not dealt with, if that heart is not addressed, none of the issues of life can be corrected. None of the issues of life can be turned. 
Man, I've known people that are just spinning their wheels dealing with the issues of life, one after the other, one failure after the other, and all they know how to do is get forgiveness from sin and then go right back into it again. And they're spinning their wheels dealing with the issues. What do I need to do, Pastor? Give your heart to Jesus. And say, God created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. You know who cried that? David, a man that utterly failed, committed adultery and murder in the same sin. Horrible what he did. You say, Pastor, I thought he was a man after God's own heart. He was and he blew it. He sinned miserably. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But when God got a hold of David and began to deal with him, sent Nathan the prophet and said, Thou art the man. David began to cry out, O God, renew a right spirit in me, Lord. Create in me a clean heart, Lord. Don't take your spirit from me, Lord. Are you hearing me, church? You can do the same thing. I can do the same thing. Hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you, though we have received a new heart through salvation, and though we've known the wonderful gift of a new heart, the words of Solomon are still so very true to us. You have a born-again heart, praise God. You have a new heart, praise God. You've given your heart to Jesus Christ, praise God. But Solomon's words are still true for you and me. With all diligence now, keep that heart. Come on now. I've known folks spend more time keeping their cars than they keep their heart. Come on now. They're more worried about a water stain on the hood than they are a sin stain in the heart or the direction the heart is beginning to take or the drawing away from the presence of God that the heart is be- Are you hearing me, church? He said, in all you're keeping, above all of your keeping, keep that heart. Pay attention to the heart. It's not enough just to understand what the Bible says about the heart, but we must weigh the things in our life in the context of our heart. The things that issue forth from our life, we need to learn to weigh them in the context of the heart. You talk to any of these water engineers, and many times you'll find them. I've run into them up fishing on the mountain, and they'll be the, they'll come down to one of them creeks, and and I'm interested in the fish, and they 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 got a little test tube, and, and they're picking up water, and they're shaking it in the little test tube, and they're testing what's in that water because it's coming out of that reservoir. They want to know the acidic content, and they want to know the lead content, and they want to know what's in that reservoir and what's coming out and feeding you and me. And quite frankly, I thank God they're doing that, that they're monitoring the reservoir, that they're keeping tabs on what's coming out of that. Are you hearing? If you want to walk before God, sir, you got to keep that heart. you got to pay attention to what that heart's producing. You got to take a look at why would I say what I just said? Oh my. Why am I feeling like I'm feeling towards my brother or my sister? Come on now. Why am I acting like I'm acting? How come I'm putting myself above somebody else? Is there pride in that heart? Are you hearing me, church? Solomon said, above all, keeping. Keep your heart. There's something that you and I really should pay attention to here this morning, and that is this. There is one undeniable repeated fact in the Scriptures, and that is this. The Lord tries the heart. Had it said over and over again, we do well to remember that the God we're dealing with, whose attention is on us, is on our heart. The things that men see and that men glorify and that men think are important are of very little consequence to God. God bypasses all of that and He goes right down to the great concern and that is His concern for your heart and mine. Solomon said, with all you're keeping, above all you're keeping, keep your heart. In fact, 
This is what you need to pay a lot of attention to. Do you know why? Because that's what God's paying attention to. God's monitoring that reservoir. God's weighing that reservoir. He's looking at our heart. He's dealing with our heart. When we were fasting and praying this this week, God was weighing our hearts in that fast and in that prayer. When we came to the house of God and we entered into His presence, God was weighing those prayers. When we were singing these songs this morning, God was weighing that worship that was issuing forth out of the heart. Oh, come on, church, are you hearing me over and again? The Bible says that God weighs and He tries the heart. In fact, He is the one who sees the heart in absolute perfect clarity. There is no greater, more accurate judge of the heart than Him. Jesus said in Jeremiah 17 and 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then right after that, the very next word said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, that is the depth inwards of a man, even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Think about that for just a minute. You read in Scripture when Jesus' enemies began to try to use certain things against him to trap him. You remember when the four friends let their buddy down through the roof? That's one of the coolest stories in the Gospels. They couldn't get this boy in to see Jesus, to get him healed. They crawled upon the roof and disassembled the roof, ripped a hole in it, and let him down on the stretcher in front of Jesus. And the Bible says the first thing Jesus did is said, your sins are forgiven you. He hadn't healed him yet. He said, your sins are forgiven you. And the Pharisees immediately began to think within themselves, who does he think he is that he can forgive sins? And they began to chide within themselves. And the Bible specifically says Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to him, why do you reason such things in your hearts? He said, so you'll know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth. He turned to the young man laying in that bed, and he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And that boy that got carried in carried his own bed out the door. Hallelujah. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying there's never been a time that Jesus didn't already know the heart. Hallelujah. You remember way back when Samuel was sent to the house of Jesse to find a new king? God said, I found me somebody after my own heart. You're going to go anoint him. He got to Jesse's house. Jesse had all these boys. He lined them all up. Well, I mean, there's some, there some strong boys there, some tall boys there, some, guy, some guys that really look like leaders. I mean, you just look at him and say, boy, he'd make a good king, and he'd make a good boy. He just looks right. He, he talks right. He, he, he's, he's got a strong voice. And, he, and, and all these things that you would think make a person a king, and everyone that Samuel went through, God said, no, nope, he's not the one. From the biggest to the smallest, Samuel went to every one of them. No, nope, they're not the one. Until God tells him, the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Jesse, do you have any more boys? Yeah, there's one, a little ruddy kid out there taking care of the sheep. Go get him. Even Jesse didn't think he was king material. And he went and got his boy and walked him in. And God said, there's the next king of Israel. Had a little ruddy boy, all the brothers looking down upon him. He didn't have any rights in the whole pecking order, if you will. And God said, that's the one. See, what you don't know, Samuel, is while he's out there tending those sheep, he's out there writing psalms unto me. He's out there singing unto me. He's out there praying. What you don't know, Samuel, is that while he's out there protecting his sheep, a lion and a bear came to protect them, and he rose up in my spirit and my power and took them in his own hands and rent them and saved his sheep. That's a man after my own heart, and that's the one. You see, Samuel, I'm not looking at what you're looking at. I'm looking at the heart. Blessed God. Solomon said, the finding pot is for silver, the furnace is for gold, but the Lord tries the hearts. Look how deep the word of God reaches into you and me. In Hebrews 4 and 12 said, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts 
and intents of the heart. Nothing like the Word of God to just peel back the layers of the heart and reveal what's really going on in our hearts. Have you ever been reading the Word of God and had a verse just so convict you? Had God's words just so pierced to the depth and all of a sudden you realize, I've been in error, Lord. I've been wrong. Have you ever been in a message and the man of God's preaching, wherever that's at and whoever that is, and he begins to say things that it's like he was in your living room last week. That ain't the man, sir. That's the Holy Ghost taking the Word of God to the depth of our heart. Hallelujah. Why? Because God's primary concern in you and me is the heart. We have to realize that the God we're serving, the God we're worshiping, the God we're praying to, the God that we trust is a God that searches our hearts. Our hearts are ever before Him. When we pray, this is where the eyes of God are. When we sing songs of worship, this is what is in His view. When we serve Him in any capacity, His eyes are immediately upon our hearts, weighing it, trying it, and proving our heart. This is the God with whom we have to do. All right. Considering all of that, considering everything that comes forth from the heart, considering how important that reservoir is, and considering that that is where the eyes of God are in your life and mine, then does it not stand to reason when we begin to seek God for a move? It has to begin in the heart. That God's dealings have to begin in the heart. Those that approach the throne of God, those that seek to know Him, those that truly seek His face must begin right here in the heart, through the heart, with the heart, and addressing the condition of the heart. James said those infamous words in 4 and 8. He said, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Can, can I say something to you here this morning? God has made a way for you and me to access the throne of God. I want you to consider that. God desires for you to approach the throne of God. He wants you to talk to Him, and He wants to talk to you. You don't have to come to a priest to do that. You can talk to Him in your car. You can talk to Him at your job. You can talk to Him in your home. You can talk to Him in any situation of your life. Sometimes all you can do is cry out the name Jesus in a moment of desperation, and guess what? You've stepped in to His presence, and He hears you. He desires a friendship with you. He desires a relationship with you. He desires to walk with you and you to walk with Him. And guess what? The Bible said when Jesus cried, it is finished. The veil that separated the presence of God from mankind was split in two, opened wide open. No man could go there but once a year and only with the blood. But when the blood of Jesus was shed, that veil was split in two. You know what God was saying? He said to you and me, come in. Judy, come in to my presence. Janet, come in to my presence. Connie, come in to my presence. The price has been paid. Come in. You can know a holy God. You can walk with a holy God. You can seek His face. Hallelujah. James said if you'll draw nigh to Him, you know what He does? He don't turn around and run. You don't have to chase him. I said, you don't have to chase him and beg him, please, Lord, please, Lord, please. I used to have a friend when I was a kid. He'd do that to me. He was older than me. I looked up to him so much. And I remember he'd play those games with me. He'd throw a little piece of bait out for me and get me interested in something, then turn and walk away. He wanted me going after him, begging him, come on, come on, come back. That's not the God we serve. James said, if you'll draw nigh to God, He don't turn away from you. He turns to you. 
Let me say something to you here this morning. When you call on the name of Jesus, heaven immediately responds. You say, Pastor, I've been praying for something for a long time, and I haven't had an answer yet. Well, heaven responded. The minute you open your mouth, heaven responded. Zacharias, we learned in our Bible study, they prayed for a kid however long ago. But that angel showed up and said, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God Almighty. You prayed that prayer, Zacharias. I was there when it registered in heaven. Hallelujah. God desires a relationship with you. You say, oh, Pastor, you just don't know who I am. Don't you let the devil tell you that this morning. Pastor, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've been into. I'm not qualified. Well, neither am I. But if you put the past under the blood, come on now. If you put sin under the blood, the blood qualifies you. Hallelujah. So, well, Pastor, I'm just a brand new Christian. I'm just not there yet. No, if you're born again, you're there. You can talk to him. You can have fellowship with him. But to approach him, not carelessly, come on now, not irreverently. It's not an aside. It's not a joke. We don't come to him like we go to McDonald's. Come on now. I'll take a couple of cheeseburgers, Lord, side of French fries, hold the onions, hold the tomatoes. That's not how we approach Jesus. We come before him as he is, as all of who he is. He's the one that created the universe. He's the one that spoke it all into existence. He's the all-knowing one. He's the all-powerful one. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning and the end. Books could be written, and the world could not contain to describe who you're coming before. Does it not stand to reason then the greatest quest a life could have is to know as he is, not as we preconceived him to be, Not as somebody told us that he was, but as he is. You can know him as he is. Every day of your life, you can know a little bit more of him. I'm not just talking about him. You can know him. You can know him. Oh, come on now. You know what it is when you begin to know someone. You begin to know how they think. You begin to know what they're fixing to say. There's married couples in this place. You can complete each other's sentences without even thinking about it. Your spouse can just give you a look, and you know what they're thinking. You know what I'm talking about? Honey, I love this car. Can we? Nope. Okay. Sweetheart, this is the best gun in my whole collection. It would be if you'd let me buy it. I'll tell you, it, it, right. Not one word. Why? Because we know him. You can know God that way. He doesn't have to be some distant, out of, out of space being. Come on. He doesn't have to be somebody that we just imagine things about and wonder things about. You can know him for yourself. But he said, if you draw nigh to God, and he draws nigh to you, this is how it's got to get done. First, you got to cleanse your hands, you sinners. That's what he said. You got to deal with sin. If sin is there, you got to put it under the blood. You got to repent of it. You know what that word simply means? It means to turn. Amen. This is the way I was walking. I'm not going to walk that way no more. Sometimes we just need to come to an old-fashioned altar and put sin on the altar and walk away from it and never pick it up again. And just determine, I'm done. It's over with. Devil comes in and he says, oh, that's what you think. I'll have you back in that addiction by tomorrow. No, if you make the decision to repent, God will give you the grace to walk away because he who the Son sets free is free indeed. you got to deal with sin because sin's not going to come into his presence. You can't play games with God. You can't drag along that sin. Come on now. And then get into His presence and play games. And pretend you're not there. Are you hearing me? you got to be honest about sin. you got to be thorough about sin. you got to lay it on the altar as it is. And, and you can't get that, come on now, church-going ego about sin. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about the way we get a lot of times as church folks. 
Our sin somehow ain't as bad as the sin out there in that world. We're so good at calling everybody else a sin out that's out there in that world. But what about right here? Let me tell you something. Lying in here is as bad as lying out there. Sin in here is as bad as sin out there. You've got to be honest enough to deal thoroughly with sin. He said, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Then he said something else. Purify your heart, you double-minded. He said, you got to deal with impurity in the heart. Now, I'm not talking about sin. We've already dealt with sin. I'm talking about a pure heart, a single heart. Let me read you something I found very interesting. An author said this, and I I love the words that he spoke about it. He said, a man's force in this world, other things being equal, is just in the ratio and force and strength, uh, in the ratio of the force and strength of his heart. A full-hearted man is always a powerful man. If he be erroneous, then he is powerful for error. If the thing in his heart, if the thing is in his heart, he's sure to make it notorious, even though it may be a downright falsehood. Let a man never be so ignorant. Still, if his heart be full of love to a cause, he becomes a powerful man for that object. Because he has heart power, heart force. A man may be deficient in many of the advantages of education and many of the niceties which are so looked upon in society. But once give him a good, strong heart that beats hard and there is no mistake about his power. Let him have a heart that is right full up to the brim with an object and that man will do the thing or else he'll die gloriously defeated and will glory in his defeat. Heart is power. Think about that for just a minute. He's talking about a whole heart, a sold-out heart, a committed heart, a made-up mind of a heart. Hallelujah. Think about the fact that there's people in history outside of Scripture, there's people in history that accomplished great things simply because their heart was all in. You you think about some of the greatest generals in the wars that we fought over the years. What made them great is their heart was all in it. And where it really showed up was not in their strategy. It It was not in their planning. It was in those dark hours where it did not seem like they were ever going to win. And something pulled through. What was it? Heart power. right. Even if a person is in error, if he's in error in with all of his heart, it's a powerful error. Many a men have accomplished great things that were wrong. Come on now. And they were wrong and even wicked, but they were sold out in their heart. Consider the fact that Hitler was such a man. One thing you can say about him is he was wholehearted to his wicked cause. As wicked as he was, he was wholehearted. What do you mean, Pastor? How do you know that? Because it took the best of most of the nations of the world to stop him. A wholehearted man or woman is a powerful man or woman. Now that principle aside, or taking that principle, if you will, If you take a heart that is sold out, wholehearted, but you make the object of that heart Jesus Christ, you make the object of that heart to know God and God alone, you've got a man powerful in prayer. You've got a woman that knows how to get a hold of God. You've got a mama that can get a hold of God for her lost kids. You've got a preacher that can make it into a hospital room and pray for the sick. Are you hearing me, church? You've got somebody that can get a hold of God. Hallelujah. Why? Because of heart power. James said, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And then he said, purify your heart, you double-minded. David cried this. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Who is it? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. 
He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him and that seek his face, O Jacob, say law. I want you to hear that this morning before we close. He said, who is it that ascends that hill? Who is it that makes it into his presence? Who is it that stands before him? Who is it that comes to know him? Who is it that seeks the Lord? He said, they that have a clean, that clean, have clean hands and a pure heart. In other words, I have made up my mind. I'm going to know this God. He's the passion of my heart. He's the desire of my soul. There's nothing else I want but him. Blessed God. He said, if we'll seek him with a pure heart, we will find him. Hallelujah. How do you know? Because Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Deuteronomy said in 4 and 29, but if thou from thence shall seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all of thy heart and all of thy soul. Can I say to you this morning, before us lies an incredible opportunity to know the Holy One of Israel, to seek His face, to get on board with what He seeks to do in this last hour. We have only to deal with the reservoir of our life, to make it single, to make it pure, to make it sole purpose and passion, the same God who made us His. Would you stand with me this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With all diligence, keep thy heart, for out of it are the issues of life. What would it be for a people to totally give their heart to God? What would it be? I'm not talking just about salvation here. I'm talking about what would it be for a people to make the decision that they're going to be wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ. Men all over the world have accomplished great things because they put one single thing in their heart. Oh, that the church would put one single being in their heart, Jesus Christ. Father, I love you and thank you for your word and your help to preach it this morning. I thank you, Lord God, for dealing with us as you have. I thank you for a week of fasting and prayer, and I thank you for all that you're doing through it and in it, and what's coming out of it. But Lord God, it's not over. It's just beginning. God, the fast may be over, but seeking you has just begun. Hallelujah. Lord, find a people here that's willing to rid themselves of everything that makes the heart impure, and God willing to make you everything in their heart. Lord, Become the sole focus of our heart's desire. Become everything to our heart, O God. Let your people seek you, O God, with a pure heart. For, Lord, those are the ones that will find you. In this hour, Lord, we want to be a part of what you're doing. We want to be a part, God, of the lives you're changing, the things taking place in this hour. So, Lord, we seek you in these altars today. I love you and I thank you. Hallelujah. Heads bowed and eyes closed before we go home today. I want to open these altars up for all that desire to just come and spend some time alone with God. And I would challenge everybody here to find a place and get alone with God and let Him search the reservoir of your life. Let Him begin to look through the things that stand in the way between you and Him and, and let Him begin to deal with those things. Let me just say this to you. Sometimes the issue is surrender. We just need to turn loose of those things that keep us from loving God with a pure heart. But I would also say this morning, if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I'd sure like to get started in a journey like that. My heart has produced a lot of things that have cost me dearly. And I've done everything I can to fix the problems. I just keep having the problems. I'd like to have that new heart you're talking about, Pastor. I got good news for you, Jesus. It's ready to give you that new heart this morning. Uh, he's not going to make you wait till tomorrow or next week or next month. He's right here right now. He wants to give you a brand new heart this morning. He wants to change your life and make you new. 
And if that's you this morning, if you'll come down to this altar and give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, he'll give you a new heart. If you're willing to say, Lord, I'm a sinner, the fruits and the issues of my life have been miserable, but, oh, God, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. He's right here, right now, ready to wash your sin completely away, the guilt and the stain of it completely away, such that he will never remember it against you again. He's ready to do that for you right now. And I just wonder if in this place, as we come around this altar, if there's those that would say, Pastor, I'm ready to truly give my heart to Jesus Christ. Then God's ready to receive you this morning. I say to the church, I say to those, you've been in this thing however long you've been in it, however long you've been walking with God, I still say to you, give your heart wholly to Jesus Christ. And watch what God will do with it. These altars are open this morning. I invite you to come and spend some time with God before we go home. We love you. So glad you're here today. God bless you. Hallelujah.